um, hit the color. B L U E. Pick a number. Eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Pick one more number. Fifteen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Pick another number. Thank you. 
Hey man, it's me. Um, I just got back into town. I thought maybe I could uh, bum a ride off here or something, but that's cool. Like I'll probably just take a cab, something like that. Um, yeah, I guess I'll hang out with you later or something like that.
The reason why I refuse to take existentialism as just another French fashion or historical curiosity is that I think it has something very important to offer us for the new century. I'm afraid we're losing the real virtues of living life passionately, the sense of taking responsibility for who you are, the ability to make something of yourself and feeling good about life. Existentialism is often discussed as if it's a philosophy of despair, but I think the truth is just the opposite. Sartre, once interviewed, said he never really felt a day of despair in his life. But one thing that comes out from reading these guys is not a sense of anguish about life so much as a real kind of exuberance of feeling on top of it. It's like your life is yours to create. I've read the postmodernists with some interest, even admiration. But when I read them, I always have this awful, nagging feeling that something absolutely essential is getting left out. The more that you talk about a person as a social construction or as a confluence of forces or as fragmented or marginalized, what you do is you open up a whole new world of excuses. And when Sartre talks about responsibility, he's not talking about something abstract. He's not talking about the kind of self or soul that theologians would argue about. It's something very concrete. It's you and me talking, making decisions, doing things, and taking the consequences. It might be true that there are six billion people in the world and counting. Nevertheless, what you do makes a difference. It makes a difference, first of all, in material terms, makes a difference to other people, and it sets an example. And in short, I think the message here is that we should never simply write ourselves off and see ourselves as the victim of various forces. It's always our decision who we are. seems to come out of imperfection. It seems to come out of a striving and uh, a frustration. And this is where I think language came from. I mean, it came from our desire to transcend our isolation and have some sort of connection with one another. And it had to be easy when it was just simple survival like you know water we came up with a sound for that or uh saber tooth tiger right behind you we came up with a sound for that but when it gets really interesting i think is when we use that same system of symbols to communicate all the abstract and intangible things that we're experiencing what is like, frustration or what is anger or, or love? When I say love, the sound comes out of my mouth and it hits the other person's ear, travels through this Byzantine conduit in their brain, you know, through their memories of love or lack of love. And they register what I'm saying and they say, yes, they understand. But how do I know they understand? Because words are inert. They're just symbols. They're dead, you know? And, and so much of our experience is intangible. So much of what we perceive cannot be expressed. It's unspeakable. And yet, you know, when we communicate with one another and we we feel that we have connected and we think that we're understood i think we have a feeling of almost spiritual communion and that feeling might be transient but i think it's what we live for
If we're looking at the highlights of human development, you have to look at the evolution of the organism and then at the development of its interaction with the environment. Evolution of the organism will begin with the evolution of life, proceed through uh, the hominid, coming to the evolution of mankind, Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon man. Now, interestingly, what you're looking at here are three strains, biological, anthropological, development of cities, cultures, and culture, which is human expression. Now, what you've seen here is the evolution of populations, not so much the evolution of individuals. And in addition, if you look at the time scales that's involved here, two billion years for life, six million years for the hominid, 100,000 years for mankind as we know it, you see, you're beginning to see the telescoping nature of the evolutionary paradigm. And then when you get to agriculture, when you get to scientific revolution and industrial revolution, you're looking at 10,000 years, 400 years, 150 years. You're seeing a further telescoping of this evolutionary time. What that means is that as we go through the new evolution, it's going to telescope to the point we should be able to see it manifest itself within our lifetime, within a generation. The new evolution stems from information, and it stems from two types of information, digital and analog. The digital is artificial intelligence. The analog results from molecular biology, the cloning of the organism, and you knit the two together with neurobiology. Before, under the old evolutionary paradigm, one would die and the other would grow and dominate. But under the new paradigm, they would exist as a mutually supportive, non-competitive grouping, okay, independent from the external. And what is interesting here is that evolution now becomes an individually centered process, emanating from the needs and the desires of the individual and not an external process, a passive process where the individual is just at the whim of the collective. So you produce a neo-human, okay, with a new individuality, a new consciousness. But that's only the beginning of the evolutionary cycle because as the next cycle proceeds, the input is now this new intelligence. As intelligence piles on intelligence, as ability piles on ability, the speed changes. Until what? Until you reach a crescendo. In a way, could be imagined as an almost instantaneous fulfillment of human. Human and neo-human potential. It could be something totally different. It could be the amplification of the individual, the multiplication of individual existences, parallel existences. Now with the individual no longer restricted by time and space. And the manifestations of this neo-human type evolution, manifestations could be dramatically counterintuitive. That's the interesting part. The old evolution is cold, it's sterile, it's efficient, okay? And its manifestations are those of social adaptation. You're talking about parasitism, dominance, morality, okay? Uh, war, predation. These will be subject to de-emphasis. These will be subject to de-evolution. The new evolutionary paradigm will give us the human traits of truth, of loyalty, of justice, of freedom. These will be the manifestations of the new evolution. And that is what we would hope to see from this. That would be nice.
himself, I must be insane. What he fails to realize is that society has, just as he does, a vested interest in considerable losses and catastrophes. These wars, famines, floods, and quakes meet well-defined needs. And wants chaos. In fact, he's gotta have it. Depression, strife, riots, murder, all this dread. We're irresistibly drawn to that almost orgiastic state created out of death and destruction. It's in all of us. We revel in it. Sure, the media tries to put a sad face on these things, painting them up as great human tragedies. But we all know the function of the media has never been to eliminate the evils of the world. No. Their job is to persuade us to accept those evils and get used to living with them. The powers that be want us to be passive observers. Hey, you got a match? And they haven't given us any other options outside the occasional purely symbolic participatory act of voting. You want the puppet on the right or the puppet on the left? I feel that the time has come to project my own inadequacies and dissatisfactions into the socio-political and scientific schemes. Let my own lack of a voice be heard. Something you said. Something I said? Yeah. About how you often feel like you're observing your life from the perspective of an old woman about to die. Do you remember that? Yeah. I still feel that way sometimes. Like I'm looking back on my life. Like my waking life is her memories. Yeah, exactly. I heard that Tim Leary said as he was dying that he was looking forward to the moment when his body was dead, but his brain was still alive. You know how they say that there's still six to 12 minutes of brain activity after everything else is shut down? And the second of dream consciousness, right? Well, that's infinitely longer than a waking second. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. For example, I wake up and it's 10, 12, and then I go back to sleep and I have those long, intricate, beautiful dreams that seem to last for hours, and then I wake up and it's 10, 13. Yeah, exactly. So then six to 12 minutes, right, of brain activity, I mean, it, that could be your whole life. I mean, you are that woman looking back over everything. Okay, so what if I am, then what would you be in all that? Whatever I am right now. I mean, yeah, maybe I only exist in your mind. Still just as real as anything else. Yeah. 
I've been thinking also about something you said. What's that? Just about reincarnation and where all the new souls come from over time. Everybody always say that they've been the reincarnation of Cleopatra or Alexander the Great. I always want to tell them they were probably some dumb fuck like everybody else. I mean, it's impossible. Think about it. The world population has doubled in the past 40 years, right? So if you really believe in that ego thing of one eternal soul, uh -huh. then you have only 50% chance of your soul being over 40. And for it to be over 150 years old, then it's only one out of six. Right, so what are you saying then? reincarnation doesn't exist or that we're all young souls like we're what half of us are first round humans i mean no no what you, what you, no what i'm trying to say is that what's your point somehow i believe reincarnation is just a a poetic expression of what collective memory really is there was this article by this biochemist that mm -hmm. i read not long ago and he, he was talking about how when a member of a species is born, it has a billion years of memory to draw on. And this is where we inherit our instincts. I like that. It's like there's some, um, this whole telepathic thing going on that we're all a part of, whether we're conscious of it or not. I mean, that would explain why there's all these, you know, seemingly spontaneous worldwide innovative leaps in science and the arts you know like the same results popping up everywhere you know independent of each other some guy on a computer he figures something out and then almost simultaneously a bunch of other people all over the world figure out the same thing mm -hmm. they did this study they isolated a group of people over time and they you know, monitored their abilities at crossword puzzles, mm -hmm. right? And in relation to the general population, and then they secretly gave them a day old crossword, one that had already been answered by thousands of other people, right? And their scores went up dramatically, like 20%. So it's like once the answers are out there, you know, people can pick up on them. It's like we're all telepathically sharing our experiences.
You'll see me bring that cigar closer and closer to your wide open eyeball. Till you're almost out of your mind. Not quite. I want it to last a long, long time. I want you to know that it's me. That I'm the one that's doing it to you. Me! And that sissy psychiatrist. What unmedicated ignorance. That old drunken fart of a judge. What a pompous ass. Judge not, lest ye be judged. All of you shoots are gonna die the day I get out of this shit hole. I guarantee you will regret the day you met me. In a way, in our contemporary worldview, it's easy to think that science has come to take the place of God. But some philosophical problems remain as troubling as ever. Take the problem of free will. This problem has been around for a long time, since before Aristotle in 350 BC. St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, these guys all worried about how we can be free if God already knows in advance everything you're going to do. Nowadays, we know that the world operates according to some fundamental physical laws. And these laws govern the behavior of every object in, in the world. Now, these laws, because they're so trustworthy, they enable incredible technological achievements. But look at yourself. We're just physical systems too, right? We're just complex arrangements of carbon molecules. We're mostly water. And our behavior isn't going to be an exception to these basic physical laws. So it starts to look like whether it's God setting things up in advance and knowing everything you're going to do, or whether it's these basic physical laws governing everything, there's not a lot of room left for freedom. So now you might be tempted to just ignore the question, ignore the mystery of free will. Say, oh, well, it's just a historical anecdote. It's, it's sophomoric. It's a, it's a question with no answer. You know, just, just forget about it. But the question keeps staring you right in the face. Think about individuality, for example, who you are. Who you are is mostly a matter of the free choices that you make or take responsibility. You can only be held responsible. You can only be found guilty or you can only be admired or respected for things you did of your own free will. So the question keeps coming back and we don't really have a solution to it. It starts to look like all your decisions are really just a charade. Think about how it happens. There's some electrical activity in your brain. Your neurons fire. They send a signal down into your nervous system. It passes along down into your muscle fibers. They twitch. You might say reach out your arm. Looks like it's a free action on your part. But every one of those, every part of that process is actually governed by physical law, chemical laws, electrical laws, and so on. So now it starts to look like the Big Bang set up the initial conditions and the whole rest of our history, the whole rest of human history and even before, is really just sort of the playing out of subatomic particles according to these basic fundamental physical laws. We think we're special. We think we have some kind of special dignity. But that now comes under threat. I mean, that's really challenged by this picture. So you might be saying, well, wait a minute. What about quantum mechanics? I know enough contemporary physical theory to know it's not really like that. It's, it's really a probabilistic theory. There's room, it's loose, it's not deterministic. And that's going to enable us to understand free will. But if you look at the details, it's not really going to help because what happens is you have some very small quantum particles and their behavior is apparently a bit random. They sort of swerve. Their behavior is absurd in the sense that it's unpredictable and we can't understand it based on anything that came before. It just does something out of the blue, according to a probabilistic framework. But is that going to help with freedom? I mean, should our freedom just be a matter of probabilities, just some random swerving in a chaotic system? That starts to seem like it's worse. I'd rather be a gear in a big deterministic physical machine than just some random swerving. So we can't just ignore the problem. We have to find room in our contemporary worldview for persons with all that that entails, not just bodies, but persons. 
And that means trying to solve the problem of freedom, finding room for choice and responsibility, and trying to understand individuality. You can't fight City Hall. Death and taxes. Don't talk about politics or religion. This is all the equivalent of enemy propaganda rolling across the picket line. Lay down, GI. Lay down, GI. We saw it all through the 20th century, and now in the 21st century, it's time to stand up and realize that we should not allow ourselves to be crammed into this rat maze. We should not submit to dehumanization. I don't know about you, but I'm concerned with what's happening in this world. I'm concerned with the structure. I'm concerned with the systems of control, those that control my life and those that seek to control it even more. I want freedom! That's what I want! And that's what you should want! It's up to each and every one of us to turn loose of just some of the greed, the hatred, the envy, and yes, the insecurities. Because that is the central mode of control. Make us feel pathetic, small. So we'll willingly give up our sovereignty, our liberty, our destiny. We have got to realize that we're being conditioned on a mass scale. Start challenging this corporate slave state. The 21st century is going to be a new century. Not the century of slavery. Not the century of lies and issues of no significance and classism and statism and all the rest of the modes of control. It's going to be the age of humankind standing up for something pure and something right. What a bunch of garbage, liberal, democrat, conservative, republican. It's all there to control two sides of the same coin. Two management teams bidding for control, the CEO job of Slavery Incorporated. The truth is out there in front of you, but they lay out this buffet of lies. I'm sick of it, and I'm not going to take a bite out of it. Do you got me? Resistance is not futile. We're going to win this. Humankind is too good. We're not a bunch of underachievers. We're going to stand up and we're going to be human beings. We're going to get fired up about the real things, the things that matter. Creativity and the dynamic human spirit that refuses to submit. Well, that's it. That's all I got to say. It's in your court. The quest is to be liberated from the negative, which is really our own will to nothingness. And once having said yes to the instant, the affirmation is contagious. It bursts into a chain of affirmations that knows no limit. To say yes to one instant is to say yes to all of existence. The main character is what I might call the mind. Its mastery, its capacity to represent. Throughout history, attempts have been made to contain those experiences which happen at the edge, at the limit, where the mind is vulnerable. But I think we are in a very significant moment in history those moments, those what I might call liminal, limit, frontier, edge zone experiences are actually now becoming the norm. These multiplicities and distinctions and differences that have given great difficulty to the old mind are actually through entering into their very essence, tasting and feeling their uniqueness one might make a breakthrough to that common something that holds them together. And so the main character is, to this new mind, greater, greater mind. A mind that yet is to be. And when we have obviously entered into that mode, you can see a radical subjectivity, radical attunement to individuality, uniqueness, to that which the mind is, opens itself to a vast 
objectivity. So the story is a story of the cosmos now. The moment is not just a passing, empty, nothing, yet. And this is in, in the way in which these secret passages happen. Yes, it's empty with such fullness that the great moment, the great life of the universe is pulsating in it. And each one, each object, each place, each act leaves mark. And that story is singular, but in fact, it's story after story. Never both simultaneously. Such a strange paradox. I mean, well, technically, I'm closer to the end of my life than I've ever been. I actually feel more than ever that I have all the time in the world. When I was younger, there was a desperation, a, a desire for certainty, like there was an end to the path and I had to get there. I know what you mean because I can remember thinking, oh, Someday, like in my mid-30s maybe, everything's going to just somehow gel and settle, mm -hmm. just end. It was like there was this plateau and it was waiting for me and I was climbing up it and when I got to the top, all growth and change would stop. Even exhilaration, oh, that, that hasn't happened like that, thank goodness. I think that what we don't take into account when we're young is our endless curiosity. That's what's so great about being human. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you know that thing Benedict Anderson says about identity? No. Well, he's talking about, like, say, a baby picture. So you pick up this picture, this two-dimensional image, and you say, that's me. Well, to connect this baby in this weird little image with yourself living and breathing in the present, you have to make up a story like, this was me when I was a year old and then later I had long hair and then we moved to Riverdale and now here I am. So it takes a story that's actually a fiction to make you and the baby in the picture identical, to create your identity. And the funny thing is, our cells are completely regenerating every seven years. We've already become completely different people several times over. And yet we always remain quintessentially ourselves. Critique began as all critiques begin, with doubt. Doubt became our narrative. Ours was a quest for a new story, our own. And we grasped toward this new history driven by the suspicion that ordinary language couldn't tell it. Our past appeared frozen in the distance, and our every gesture and accent signified the negation of the old world and the reach for a new one. The way we lived created a new situation, one of exuberance and friendship, that of a subversive micro-society in the heart of a society which ignored it. Art was not the goal, but the occasion and a method for locating our specific rhythm and buried possibilities of our time. The discovery of a true communication was what it was about, or at least the quest for such a communication. The adventure of finding it and losing it. We, the unappeased, the unaccepting, continued looking, filling in the silences with our own wishes, fears, and fantasies, driven forward by the fact that no matter how empty the world seemed, no matter how degraded and used up the world appeared to us, 
We knew that anything was still possible and, given the right circumstances, a new world was just as likely as an old one. two kinds of sufferers in this world, those who suffer from a lack of life and those who suffer from an overabundance of life. I have always found myself in the second category. When you come to think of it, almost all human behavior and activity is not essentially any different from animal behavior. The most advanced technologies and craftsmanship bring us, at best, up to the super chimpanzee level. Actually, the gap between, say, Plato or Nietzsche and the average human is greater than the gap between that chimpanzee and the average human. The realm of the real spirit, the true artist, the saint, the philosopher, is rarely achieved. Why so few? Why is world history and evolution not stories of progress, but rather this endless and futile addition of zeros? No greater values have developed. Hell, the Greeks 3,000 years ago were just as advanced as we are. So what are these barriers that keep people from reaching anywhere near their real potential? The answer to that can be found in another question, and that's this. Which is the most universal human characteristic? Fear or laziness? What are you writing? A novel. What's the story? There's no story. It's just... people. Gestures. Moments. Bits of rapture. Fleeting emotions. In short... The greatest stories ever told. <laughs> Are you in the story? I don't think so. But then I'm kind of reading it and then writing it. was in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere, but on the way to Vegas. So, you know, every once in a while, a car would pull in, get gas. It was the last gas stop before Vegas. Office had the chair, had a cash register, and that was all the room there was in that office. I was asleep, and I heard a noise, you know, in my mind. So I got up and I walked out and I was stood on the curb of where the gas station ends, you know, the driveway there, rubbing the sand out of my eyes, trying to see what's going on. And way down at the very end of the gas station, they had tire racks, chains around them, you know. And I see there's an Econoline van down there. And there's a guy with his T-shirt off. And he's packing this Econoline van <laughs> with all of these tires. He's got the last two tires in his hands, pushes them into the thing. And I, and I of course, I go, hey! 
you. This guy turns around. He's got no shirt on. He's sweating. He's built like a brick shit house. Pulls out a knife, 12 inches long, and then starts running at me as fast as he can, going, ah! <laughs> I'm still. This is wrong. <laughs> I walked in, dug my hand behind the cash register where the owner kept a 41 revolver. Pull it out, cocked the trigger, and just as I turned around, just he was coming through the door, and I could see his eyes. I'll never forget this guy's eyes. And he just had bad thoughts about me in his <laughs> eyes. And I fired around and it hit him, boom, right in the chest. Bang, he went as fast as he was coming in the door, he went out the door, went right up between the two pumps, ethyl and regular. And he must have been on drugs on speed or something, you know, because he stood up. <laughs> and he was still the knife and the blood was just all over his chest. And he, and he stood up and he, uh, like that, just moved a little like that. And I was pretty much in shock. So I just held the trigger back and fanned the hammer. It was one of those old time. Boom, 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 boom. And I blew him out of the gas station. And ever since then, I always carry this. I hear that. Well-armed populace is the best defense against tyranny. I'll drink to that. And you know, I haven't fired this in such a long time, I don't even know if it'll work. Hey, why don't you pull the trigger and find out? Hey man, uh, I guess you already took off or something, but uh, remind me to tell you about this dream I had last night because there's some really funny stuff in it. Alright man, uh, I guess I'll catch you later. Okay. Anticipating salvation, absolution, not even enlightenment through process. I, I subscribe to the premise that this, this flawed perfection is sufficient and complete in every single ineffable moment. The blind bee, the firefly, the man just sleep. Lunatic macaroni munchkin with my good guy. 
venerable tradition of sorcerers, shamans, and other visionaries who have developed and perfected the art of dream travel, the so-called lucid dream state, whereby consciously controlling your dreams, you're able to discover things beyond your capacity to apprehend in your awake state. Tell someone about what Felix is doing. A single ego is an absurdly narrow vantage from which to view this, this experience. And where most consider their, their individual relationship to the universe. I contemplate relationships of my various selves to one another. While most people with mobility problems are having trouble just getting around, at age 92, Joy Cullison's out seeing the world. thing about life. See, there's a lot of us that are out there that are mapping that mind-body relationship of dreams. We're called the Oneironauts. We're the explorers of the dream world. Really, it's just about the two opposing states of consciousness, which don't really oppose at all. See, in the waking world, the neural system inhibits the activation of the vividness of memories. And this makes evolutionary sense. See, it'd be maladaptive for the perceptual image of a predator to be mistaken for the memory of one, and vice versa. If the memory of a predator conjured up a perceptual image, we'd be running off to the bathroom every time we had a scary thought. So you have these serotonic neurons that inhibit hallucinations, that they themselves are inhibited during REM sleep. See, this allows dreams to appear real while preventing competition from other perceptual processes. This is why dreams are mistaken for reality. To the functional system of neural activity that creates our world, there is no difference between dreaming a perception and an action and actually the waking perception and action. Hey man. 
man. What are you doing here? I fancy myself the social lubricator of the dream world. Helping people become lucid a little easier. You know, cut out all that fear and anxiety stuff and just rock and roll. By becoming lucid, you mean just knowing that you're dreaming, right? Yeah, and then you can control it. They're more realistic and less bizarre than non-lucid dreams. You know, I just woke from a dream. Uh, it wasn't like a typical dream. It seemed more like I'd walked into an alternate universe or something. Yeah, it's real. I mean, technically, it's a phenomenon of sleep. But you can have so much damn fun in your dreams. And of course, everyone knows fun rules. Yeah. So what was going on in your dream? Oh, um, a lot of people, a lot of talking. You know, some of it was kind of absurdist, like from a strange movie or something. Most of it was just people going off about whatever, uh, really intensely. Uh, I woke up wondering, uh, where did all this stuff come from? You can control that, you know. Do you have these dreams all the time? Hell yeah, I'm always going to make the best of it. But the trick is, you got to realize that you're dreaming in the first place. You got to be able to recognize it. You got to be able to ask yourself, hey man, is this a dream? See, most people never ask themselves that when they're awake or especially when they're asleep. Seems like everyone's sleepwalking through their waking state or wake walking through their dreams. Either way, they're not going to get much out of it. The thing that snapped me into realizing I was dreaming was uh, it's my digital clock. I, I couldn't really read it. It's like the, uh, the circuitry was all screwed up or something. Yeah, that's real common. And small printed material is pretty tough too. Very unstable. Another good tip off is trying to adjust light levels. You can't really do that. If you see a light switch nearby, turn it on and off and see if it works. That's one of the few things you can't do in a lucid dream. What the hell, I can fly around, have an interesting conversation with Albert Schweitzer. I can explore all these new dimensions of reality. And not to mention, I can have any kind of sex I want, which is way cool. So I can't adjust light levels, so what? But that's like one of the things that you do to test if you're dreaming or not, right? Yeah, like I said, you can totally train yourself to recognize it. I mean, just hit a light switch every now and then. If the lights are on and you can't turn them off, then most likely you're dreaming. And then you can get down to business. And believe me, it's unlimited. Hey, you know what I've been working on lately? What's that? Oh man, it's way ambitious, but I'm getting better at it. You're gonna dig this. 360 vision, man. I can see in all directions. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Man. Well, I gotta go, man. Okay, later, man. Super profundo on the early eve of your day. What's that mean? Well, you know, I've never figured it out. Maybe you can. This guy always whispers it in my ear. Lewis, he's a recurring dream character. <laughs> Thank you.
into a bar and you know he sees a dwarf you know <laughs> you know that works really well because you're imagining this guy and this dwarf and this bar and this is kind of like imaginative aspect to it but in film you don't have that because you actually are filming a specific guy in a specific bar with a specific dwarf of a specific height who looks a certain way right mm -hmm. so like um for Bazin what the ontology of film has to do is has to do with you know whether with with photography also has an ontology of right except that it has this dimension of time to it you know and like this greater realism and so like it's about that guy at that moment in that space and and you know Bazin is like a Christian so he like believes that you know in God obviously and that like everything he believes for him reality and God are the same, you know, like and so what film is actually capturing is like God incarnate, creating, you know, and like this very moment, like, you know, um God is manifesting as this. And what the film would capture if it was filming us right now would be like God as this table and God is you and God is me and God looking the way we look right now and saying and thinking what we're thinking right now because that is, you know, we're all God manifest in that sense. Mm -hmm. So film is actually like a record of God or of the face of God or of the ever-changing face of God. You have a mosquito. Let me get it for you. You got it. <laughs> got it? Yeah, you got it. Okay. And like a whole Hollywood thing is just taking like film and like just try to like make it the storytelling medium where like you take these, you know, books or stories and then you like, you know, and then you like you have the script and then you try to find somebody who sort of fits the thing, but it's ridiculous because it's not it shouldn't be based on the script, you know, it should be based on the person, you know, or the thing. And um and in that sense they're almost right to have this whole star system because then at least it's about like that person, you know. Right. Yeah. You know, instead of like the story. Mm -hmm. But you know, like Truffaut always said that, you know, the best films are made the, the film, the best scripts don't make the best films, you know, because they have that kind of literary, you know, narrative thing, you know, that you're sort of a slave to. The best films, you know, are the ones that aren't like tied to that slavishly. So, um, so I don't know, the whole narrative thing just seems to me like, uh, you know, obviously there's a narrativity to cinema because it's in time, just the way it's a narrativity to music, mm -hmm. you know, you don't. You don't first think of the story of the song and then make the song, you know, it has to come out of the, that moment, you know, and that's what the film has, it's just that, that moment, which is holy, you know, like, like this moment, you know, it's holy, but like we walk around like it's not holy, we walk around like, you know, there are some holy moments and there are all the other moments that are not holy, right? Right. But like this moment is holy, right? And I feel like film can let us see that, you know, it can take, frame it so that we see like, ah, this moment, you know? holy and it's like holy 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 moment by moment but like who can live that way you know who can like go wow holy because if i were to like look at you and just really like let you be holy i don't know i would like stop talking <laughs> well you'd be in the moment i mean yeah but the I'd moment like, is holy right? yeah but i'd like i'd be open and then i'd like look in your eyes and i'd cry and i'd like feel all the stuff and that's like that polite I mean, it would make you uncomfortable. Well, you could laugh too, though. I mean, why would you cry? Well, because, I don't know, I, I, for me, like, I just tend to cry. Uh huh. Well, is this. Is well, like, let's do it right now. Like, let's have a, let's have a holy moment. Okay. 
Everything is layers, isn't it? I mean, yeah. There's there's the holy moment, and then there's the awareness of trying to have the holy moment. And in the same way, that the film is the actual moment really happening, but then the character pretending to be in a different reality. And it's it's all these layers. And uh, I was in and out of the holy moment, looking at you. Can't be in a holy. You're you're unique that way. That's one of the reasons I enjoy you. You can bring me into that. If the world that we are forced to accept is false and nothing is true, then everything is possible. On the way to discovering what we love, we will find everything we hate, everything that blocks our path of what we desire. Comfort will never be comfortable for those who seek what is not on the market. A systematic questioning of the idea of happiness. We'll cut the vocal cords of every empowered speaker. We'll yank the social symbols through the looking glass with the value society's currency. To confront the familiar. Society is a fraud so complete and venal that it demands to be destroyed beyond the power of memory to recall its existence. Where there is fire, we will carry gasoline. To interrupt the continuum of everyday experience and all the normal expectations that go with it. To live as if something actually depended on one's actions. To rupture the spell of the ideology of the commodified consumer society so that our repressed desires of a more authentic nature can come forward. To demonstrate the contrast between what life presently is and what it could be. To immerse ourselves in the oblivion of action and now we're making it happen. There will be an intensity never before known in everyday life to exchange love and hate, life and death, terror and redemption, repulsions and attractions. An affirmation of freedom so reckless and unqualified that it amounts to a total denial of every kind of restraint and limitation. Hey, old man, what you doing up there? I'm not sure. You need any help getting down, sir? No, I don't think so. Stupid bastard. No worse than us. He's all action and no theory. We're all theory and no action. So glum, Mr. DeBoer. What was missing was felt irretrievable. The extreme uncertainties of subsisting without working made excesses necessary and breaks definitive. To quote Stevenson, suicide carried off many drink and the devil took care of the rest. Hey. Hey. You a dreamer? Yeah. I haven't seen too many of you around lately. 
Things have been tough lately for dreamers. They say dreaming's dead. And no one does it anymore. It's not dead, it's just it's been forgotten. Removed from our language. Nobody teaches it, so no one knows it exists. The dreamers banished to obscurity. Well, I'm trying to change all that, and I hope you are too. By dreaming every day. Dreaming with our hands and dreaming with our minds. Our planet is facing the greatest problems it's ever faced. Ever. So whatever you do, don't be bored. This is absolutely the most exciting time we could have possibly hoped to be alive. And things are just starting. in the earth is but an instant. There is nothing new, nothing different. Same pattern over and over. The same clouds, same music, the same as I felt an hour or an eternity ago. There's nothing here for me now, nothing at all. Now I remember, this happened to me before. This is why I left. You have begun to find your answers. Although it will seem difficult, the rewards will be great. Exercise your human mind as fully as possible, knowing it is only an exercise. Build beautiful artifacts, solve problems, explore the secrets of the physical universe, savor the input from all the senses, feel the joy and sorrow, the laughter, the empathy, compassion, and took the emotional memory in your travel bag. I remember where I came from and how I became a human, why I hung around, and now my final departure schedule. This way out, escaping velocity, not just eternity, but infinity. drive there. All action basically for survival, all communication simply to keep this ant colony buzzing along in an efficient, polite manner. Here's your change. Paper or plastic? Credit or debit? You want to catch up with that? I don't want a straw. I want real human moments. I want to see you. I want you to see me. I don't want to give that up. I don't want to be an ant, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I don't want to be an ant either. <laughs> yeah, thanks for kind of like jostling me there. I've been kind of on zombie autopilot lately. I don't feel like an ant in my head, but I guess I probably look like one. It's kind of like D.H. Lawrence had this idea of two people meeting on a road, and instead of just uh, passing and glancing away, they decide to accept what he calls the confrontation between their souls. It's like, um, like freeing the brave, reckless gods within us all. 
then I was like, we have met. So I'm doing this project and I'm hoping maybe you'll be interested in doing it. It's a soap opera. And so the characters are the fantasy lives or the alter egos of the performers who are in it. So you pretty much just figure out something that you've always wanted to do or life you've always wanted to lead or occupation or something like that. And we write that in. And then we also have your life intersect with other people's from the soap operas in some typical soap opera fashion. And then I also want to show it in a live live venue and have the actors present so that once uh, the episode is screened then the audience can direct the actors for subsequent episodes with um, menus or something so it has a lot to do with choices and, and honoring people's ability to say what it is that they want to see and also consumerism and art and commodity and if you don't like what you got then you can send it back or you get what you pay for or um, just participating just really you know making choices so you want to do it uh, yeah yeah that sounds really cool I'd, I'd, I'd love to be in it but um uh, uh, I, I gotta ask you a question first, though. I don't really know how to say it, but, um, uh, what's it like to be a character in a dream? Because, uh, I'm not awake right now, and I haven't even worn a watch since, like, fourth grade. I think this is the same watch, too. Um, uh, yeah, I don't even know if you're... you're able to answer that question but i'm just trying to get like a, a sense of, of where i am and, and and what's going on so what about you what's your name what's your address what are you doing <laughs> i i you know I, I can't really remember right now i can't really i can't really recall that but uh, that's that's beside the point whether or not I can dredge up this information about, you know, my address or, you know, my mom's maiden name or whatnot. I've got the benefit in this reality, if you want to call that, of a consistent perspective. What is your consistent perspective? It's mostly just me dealing with a lot of people who are exposing me to information and ideas that seem vaguely familiar, but at the same time, it's all very alien to me. I'm not in a, an objective, rational world. Like, I've been, like, flying around, uh, <clears throat> It's weird, too, because it's not like a fixed state. It's more like a, this whole spectrum of awareness, like uh, the lucidity wavers. Like, right now, I know that I'm dreaming, right? And where are you, like, even talking about it? This is the most in myself and in my thoughts that I've been so far. I'm, I'm talking about being in a dream. But I'm beginning to think that it's something that I don't really have any precedent for. It's, it's totally unique. The, the quality of, of the environment and the information that I'm, that I'm receiving, like your soap opera, for example. That's a really cool idea. I didn't come up with that. It's like something outside of myself, like something like transmitted to me externally. I don't know what this is. We seem to think we're so limited by the world and, and the confines, but we're really just creating them. You, you keep trying to figure it out, but it seems like now that you know that what you're doing is dreaming, you can do whatever you want to. You're, uh, dreaming, but you're awake, you have, um, 
there's so many options, and that's what life is about. No, I understand what you're saying. It's, it's up to me. I'm the dreamer. I don't know. It's weird. Like, so much of the information that that these people have been like imparting to me. I don't know. It's got this like really heavy connotation to it. Well, how do you feel? Well, well sometimes I feel kind of isolated, but I'm, most of the time I, I feel really connected, really like engaged in this active process, which is kind of weird because most of the time I've just been really passive and not really responding, well, except for now, I guess. Just kind of like letting the information wash over me. It's not necessarily passive to not respond verbally or communicating on on so many levels simultaneously. Perhaps you're you're perceiving directly. Most of the people that I've been encountering, and most of the things that I would want to say. It's like they kind of say it for me, and almost like at my cue. It's it's like complete unto itself. It's not like I'm having a bad dream. It's a great dream. But... It's so unlike any other dream I've ever had before. It's like the dream. Uh, it's like I'm being prepared for something.
guys remembering is so much more a psychotic activity than forgetting. Lorca in that same poem said that the iguana will bite those who do not dream. And as one realizes that one is a dream figure in another person's dream, yourself yet but the advantage to meeting others in the meantime is that one of them may present you to yourself examine the nature of everything you observe for instance you might find yourself walking through a dream parking lot and yes those are dream feet inside of your dream shoes part of your dream self and so the person that you appear to be in the dream cannot be who you really are this is an image a mental model in the late 50s or early 60s and Louis Mal just made his most expensive film which has cost two and a half million dollars and Billy Wilder asks him what the film is about 
and Louis Mel says, well, it's sort of a dream within a dream. And Billy Wilder says, you just lost two and a half million dollars. I feel a little more apprehensive about this one than I did about it. Down through the centuries, the notion that life is wrapped in a dream has been a pervasive theme of philosophers and poets. So doesn't it make sense that death too would be wrapped in dream? That after death, your conscious life would continue in what might be called a dream body? It would be the same dream body you experience in your everyday dream life, except that in the post-mortal state, you could never again wake up, never again return to your physical body. As the pattern gets more intricate and subtle, being swept along is no longer enough. What's the word, Jared? Hey, do you also drive a, a, a boat car? A what? Like, you gave me a ride in a car that was also a boat? No, man, I don't have a uh, boat car. I don't know what you're talking about. Man, this must be like parallel universe night. You know that cat that was just in here? Just ran out the door. But he comes up to the counter, you know, and I say, what's the word, turd? And he lays down this burrito, and he kind of looks at me, kind of stares at me, and then he says, I have but recently returned from the valley of the shadow of death. I am rapturously breathing in all the odors and essences of life. I have been to the brink of total oblivion. I remember and ferment a desire to remember everything. So, what did you say to that? Well, I mean, what could I say? I said, if you're going to microwave that burrito, I want you to poke holes in the plastic wrapping because they explode, and I'm tired of cleaning up your little burrito doings. You dig me? Because the jalapenos dry up. They're like little wheels. When it was over, all I could think about was how this entire notion of oneself, what we are, is, is just this logical structure, a place to momentarily house all the abstractions. It was a time to become conscious, to give form and coherence to the mystery, and I had been a part of that. It was a gift. Life was raging all around me and every moment was magical. I loved all the people dealing with all the contradictory impulses. <laughs> That's what I loved the most, connecting with the people. Looking back, that's all that really mattered.
Kierkegaard's last words were, sweep me up. this like really specific spot that you give him directions to let me off at. I get out, I ended up getting hit by a car, but then I just woke up because I was dreaming, and later than that I found out that I was still dreaming, dreaming that I'd woken up. Oh yeah, those are called false awakenings. I used to have those all the time. Yeah, but I'm still in it now. I, I can't get out of it. It's been going on forever. I keep waking up, but but I'm just waking up into another dream. Uh, I'm starting to get creeped out too, like I'm talking to 
dead people, this woman on TVs telling me about how death is this dream time that exists outside of life. I mean, uh, I'm starting to think that I'm dead. I'm going to tell you about a dream I once had. I know that's, you know, when someone says that, that's usually you're in for a very boring next few minutes. And you might be, but it sounds like, you know, what else you going to do, right? Anyway, I read this essay by Philip K. Dick. What, you read it in your dream? No, no, I read it before the dream. It was the preamble to the dream. It was about that book, um, Flow My Tears, The Policeman Said. You know that one? Uh, yeah, yeah, he, he won an award for that one. Right, right, that's the one he wrote really fast. It just like flowed right out of him. He felt he was sort of channeling it or something. But anyway, about four years after it was published, he was at this party. He met this woman who had the same name as the woman character in the book. And she had a boyfriend with the same name as the boyfriend character in the book. And she was having an affair with this guy, you know, the chief of police. And he had the same name as the chief of police in his book. So she's telling him every, you know, all this stuff from her life and everything she's saying is right out of his book. So it's really freaking him out, but you know, what can he do? And then shortly after that, he was going to mail a letter and he saw this kind of, um, you know, dangerous shady looking guy standing by his car. But instead of avoiding him, which he, you know, he said he usually would have done, he just walked right up to him and said, can I help you? And the guy said, yeah, I, I ran out of gas. So he pulls out his wallet and he hands him some money, which he says he, you know, never would have done. And then he gets home and he thinks, well, wait a second. This guy, you know, he can't get to a gas station. He's out of gas. So he gets back in his car. He goes, finds the guy takes him to the gas station, and as he's pulling up to the gas station, he realizes, hey, this is in my book too. This exact station, this exact guy, everything. So this whole episode is, is kind of creepy, right? And he's telling his priest about it, you know, describing how he wrote this book, and then four years later, all these things happened to him. And as he's telling it to him, the priest says, that's the book of Acts. You're describing the book of Acts. And he's like, I've never read the book of Acts. So he you know, goes home and reads the book of Acts. And it's like, you know, uncanny. You know, even the characters' names are the same as in the Bible. And the book of Acts takes place in 50 AD when it was written, supposedly. So Philip K. Dick had this theory that time was an illusion and then we were all actually in 50 AD. And the reason he had written this book was that he had somehow momentarily punctured through this illusion, this veil of time. And what he had seen there was what was going on in the book of Acts. And he was really into uh, Gnosticism and this idea that this demiurge or demon had created this illusion of time to make us forget, you know, that Christ was about to return and the kingdom of God was about to arrive. And that we're all in 50 AD, and there's someone trying to make us forget, you know, that, you know, God is imminent. And that's what time is. That's what all of history is. It's just kind of this continuous, um, you know, daydream or distraction. And so I read that, and I was like, well, that's weird. And then that night, I had a dream, and there was this guy in the dream who was supposed to be a psychic, but I was skeptical. I was like, yeah, he's not really a psychic. And I'm just thinking to myself. And then suddenly I start floating, like levitating up to the ceiling. And as I almost go through the roof, I'm like, okay, Mr. Psychic, I, I believe you. You're a psychic, put me down, please. And then I float down and as my feet touch the ground, the psychic turns into this woman in a green dress. And this woman is Lady Gregory. Now, Lady Gregory was Yeats's patron, this, you know, Irish person. And though I'd, I'd never seen her image, I was just sure that this was the face of Lady Gregory. So we're walking along, Lady Gregory turns to me and says, let me explain to you the nature of the universe. 
Now, Philip K. Dick is right about time, but he's wrong that it's 50 AD. Actually, there's only one instant, and it's right now, and it's eternity. And it's an instant in which God is posing a question. And that question is basically, do you want to, you know, be one with eternity? Do you want to be in heaven? And we're all saying, no, thank you. Not just yet. And so time is actually just this constant saying no to God's invitation. I mean, that's what time is. I mean, and it's no more 50 AD than it's 2001. You know, I mean, there's just this one instant and that's what we're always in. And then she tells me that actually this is the narrative of everyone's life. That, you know, behind the phenomenal difference, there is but one story. And that's the story of moving from the no to the yes. All of life is like, no thank you, no thank you, no thank you. And then ultimately it's, yes, I give in. Yes, I accept. Yes, I embrace. I mean, that's the journey. I mean, everyone gets to the yes in the end, right? Right. So we continue walking and uh, my dog runs over to me. And so I'm petting him, really happy to see him. You know, he's been dead for years. So I'm, I'm petting him and I, and I realize there's this kind of gross oozing stuff coming out of his stomach. And I look over at um, Lady Gregory and she sort of coughs. She's like, <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> and there's vomit like dribbling down her chin and it smells really bad. And I, I think, well, wait a second, that's not just the smell of vomit, which is, you know, doesn't smell very good. That's the smell of like dead person vomit. You know, so it's like doubly foul. And then I realize I'm actually in, you know, the land of the dead. And everyone around me was dead. My dog had been dead over 10 years. Lady Gregory had been dead a lot longer than that. When I finally woke up, I was like, whoa, that, wasn't a dream. That was a visitation to this real place, the land of the dead. So what happened? I mean, how did you finally get out of it? Oh man, it was just like one of those like life altering experiences. I mean, I, I could never really look at the world the same way again after that. Yeah, but I mean, like, how did you, how did you finally get out of the dream? See, that's my problem. I'm, I'm like, I'm trapped. I keep, I keep thinking that I'm waking up, but I'm still in a dream. It seems like it's going on forever. I can't get out of it. And I want to wake up for real. How do you really wake up? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not very good at that anymore. But um, if that's what you're thinking, I mean, you, you probably should. I mean, you know, if you can wake up, you should. Because, you know, someday, you know, you won't be able to. So just, um, but it's easy. You know, just, just wake up.